By far the most common questions we receive around the popular Schwab U.S. Dividend Equity ETF, SCHD, have to do with dividend taxation. So I promise you that at the end of today's presentation, you're going to learn a whole lot more about dividend taxation than when you started. So today we're going to discuss the two main types of dividend taxation. We're going to look at whether SCHD uses the good one or the bad one. We'll look at how taxation might affect passive income while considering things like IRAs, Roth IRAs, and 401ks. Now, we're MBAs, not accountants, so I'm going to start with the best advice that we could ever give you. And this surrounds my own journey through the world of taxation. And I started working at the age of 16. I was a PhD, that stands for Poor, Hungry, and Determined, and I didn't stop until I left the USA. During that time, I washed dishes, cleaned hotel rooms, I worked green, chained at a sawmill, waited tables, bus tables, cleaned highway, so I never got paid to do that. And throughout all that time, I realized how difficult it is to make money, and I wanted to uh, leverage my capabilities, so I stopped working and then decided to spend six figures on B-School. Uh, I started then working in London and realized that their tax scheme is very different. I was paying upwards of 33% in taxes, and then I realized that there are only two countries in the world that tax their citizens abroad. USA and Eritrea, which uh, I took this picture in Eritrea. This was uh, last year. I think I was the 23rd person to enter the country in April of last year. They don't get many visitors. And USA taxation law, similar to the laws in Eritrea, uh, is very incredibly complex. So I'm certainly not qualified to discuss that or navigate it. So the best thing I ever did for my financial health, this was back when I was in the States, and when I left the States is I hired appropriate tax accountants. There's two reasons you need to do that. First of all, they provide what we refer to in, in industry as CYA, as cover your ass. No accountant will, is going to risk their license to save you a few dollars. So whatever they recommend that you're doing isn't going to create any sort of risk, and they sign their name on your tax return. So if the IRS has questions, they go talking to that person. You don't have to deal with it. I've never had that happen, fortunately. More importantly, they're going to open doors to additional ways for you to save money. So that's what you need to do is get yourself an accountant. Now, that's also because the topic of taxation is quite taboo. So they say there's three things you shouldn't talk about when you're searching for your ex-wife. It's sex, money, and politics. Now, the things that you shouldn't talk about in finance uh, surround taxes. And people always say, well, go ask your accountant. Why? Because it's extraordinarily complex. And this piece by Vox on the myth of the 70,000-page federal tax code uh, talks about the that claim being clearly false and that, in fact, the tax code is only 2,600 pages long and that uh, people have been uh, hugely misled. Well, that's great news. That means that you only have to read War and Peace twice. So the 2,600-page tax code is that same equivalent. And I don't know if you've ever tried to read War and Peace. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, more enjoyable, frankly, to read the tax code. But um, that's a very difficult book to navigate. At least I found it to be. And uh, so is the federal tax code. Now, things that I've always thought about taxation, uh, this presentation was as edifying for me as it will be for you. Uh, I knew there were two types of dividend taxation schemes, qualified and unqualified, or what they say, non-qualified, and that's correct. Um, one is going to tax you using capital gains, and one is going to treat dividends as income. That's correct, too, and we're going to go into detail on both those different types. Now, I always thought it was preferential to have your dividends treated as income, right? Because it sounds better. Capital gains, ooh, scary. Income, ah, that's much better. That's incorrect. Now, I've also thought that uh, this is just a big simulation vending machine located in some bar in the universe and that you're all NPCs and it just doesn't matter anyway, but uh, that may or may not be correct. What is correct is that if you make income in the United States, and I know that half of our audience comes from outside the United States and they're going to be a little upset uh, that we're not going to touch on international dividend taxation. That's a complex topic in its own that we'll look to talk about perhaps in the future. But in the United States, it, let's say a taxpayer earns a $75,000 salary in 2023. And we took this example from Smart Asset. They provided a lot of the examples we're going to use today. So let's tax that out, all right? So the first 10% 
uh, let's say the first $11,000 is going to be taxed at 10%. See, we've done that. It's $1,100. Then the next 11,000 from 11,000 to 44,725, that chunk of money is going to be taxed at 12%. That's what they call tax brackets. You see, we've done that all the way to 75 and we've calculated those amounts. So the total tax on this $75,000 salary is $11,807.50. That's an effective tax rate of 15.74%. So if you didn't have any income, only your dividend growth portfolio, and they were treated as ordinary income, it's easy for us to figure that out. So let's say your only income is a $400,000 dividend growth portfolio yielding 3%. That means that you're receiving $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 a year. So using those previous tax brackets, we can calculate that. 10% on the first $11,000, that's $1,100. 12% on the remaining $1,000, that's $120. So really, instead of $1,000 a month, you're really receiving $898 a month, which is a tax rate of 10.2%. Now, this is sounds doesn't sound too bad, but it's actually not desirable because there's a cheaper way forward. That's referred to as capital gains tax, which sounds scary, but it's a good problem to have. Capital gains tax applies when you sell a capital asset, so stock, bond, jewelry, real estate, for more than you paid for it. And it also refers to a uh, type of dividend. We're going to talk about that. Now, the tax rate for capital gains tax varies depending on whether it's short-term or long-term. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, we're only going to focus on long-term because we're long-term investors. We don't dabble with short-term stuff. That's for losers. That's for speculators. But long-term capital gains and also on your income. Now, different capital gains tax rates, that's key, it's based on your income, apply to uh, specific types of assets, but we're going to keep this really simple. Look in the upper right there. If your taxable income, including that gain, the capital gains that for a particular year, is up to $40,400, you don't pay any capital gains tax. That's awesome, right? So that's pretty cool as opposed to the previous example that we showed you. Now, if your taxable income is more than $40,400, but not more than $445,000, the bracket jumps from 0 to 15%. So we're dealing with a, a, a very different animal here when we look at capital gains tax. So let's summarize this. Short-term capital gains are taxed as ordinary income, which is bad, but we don't talk about those because we're only interest in, interested in long-term capital gains. So the federal government taxes long-term capital gains at brackets of 0%, 15%, and 20%, depending on your filing status and income. What we also need to consider here, and somebody raised this uh, on our website, uh, most tax or most states will also tax capital gains as ordinary income. That's bad. So some of the highest maximum rates you can see here, California at 13.3 percent. Wow. Oregon at nearly nine or 10 percent. Minnesota at nearly 10 percent. New Jersey over 10 percent. So there are also states that don't tax capital gains. Well, that's nice. Places like Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Wyoming. So it's very important now that we start to think about the types of dividends in terms of these two methods of taxation that we've discussed. There's two types of ordinary dividends, qualified and non-qualified. So here's the most significant difference between the two. Non-qualified are taxed at ordinary income rates. That's bad. Qualified dividends receive more favorable tax treatment by being taxed at capital gains rates. Good. Ideally, then, you want all your dividends to be qualified. Okay, the, you say, well, what what does my stock pay, qualified or non-qualified? Well, most, I say, a large majority of the stocks in the S&P 500 that pay dividends are paying the good dividends, qualified. The most notable exception would be REITs, all right? And that's why in previous videos we've done looking at indices driving a lot of these uh, dividend ETFs, they exclude REITs for that reason. Now, you may choose to invest in REITs anyway. We do. But the big question you're all asking is this one, and there's a lot of confusion around this, is SCHD producing qualified dividends or non-qualified? Now, before we answer that, 
I wanted to point you to our own dividend growth strategy called Quantigence. Here you can build your own SCHD. And by that, I don't mean replicating SCHD's underlying index. You can build something tailored to your unique needs and market outlook. And honestly, it's really impossible to screw up because we offer you this dividend growth universe of over 80 stocks. The strategy is fully replicable in Excel. And we also provide you the entire selection process for our own portfolio of 30 DGI stocks. This is a 41-page report that uh, I and some of my esteemed colleagues spent over a decade developing. It's where the majority of our own assets are invested in. Today, you can get this report on sale for $49.99. That's going to include a coupon for 25% off Nanalyze Premium Annual. Now, we're going to run this sale for a few more days. Uh, don't expect to see this report on sale again this year because it's um, already a bargain price at $99.99. But we want to, you to see just how great the quality of reports is that we produce. So enough of the sales pitch. Let's Let's get on to answering that question. Is SCHD qualified or not? And as I said, there's a lot of confusion around this, and nobody's going to give you a concrete answer. Not Schwab, not your brokerage firm. And that's because of what I believe is the time variable. First of all, they just don't want to get involved in answering those questions. But if, if you've held SCHD for more than 60 days, then you can disregard that time variable. If you've held it for under 60 days, and you received a dividend, it's not qualified. Okay, that's a very small window. So for all practical purposes, that that little exception isn't relevant if you're somebody holding SCHD for a long term. Now, if you're using dollar cost averaging, you want to take a note of that because when you look at your 1099 div statements, which we're going to talk about in a second, you might see the fact that some of those dividends are not qualified. Now, to answer the question, is SCHD qualified or not? You need to look at the index that they use. So does the Dow Jones index used by SCHD only select stocks that have qualified dividends, the good ones? The answer is yes. We reviewed that in previous videos and looked at their methodology. So for all practical purposes, the answer to that question, is SCHD qualified or not, is yes, they have qualified dividends. Now, the ground truth is always in the 1099 div statements you should be sending your accountant every year. This is what one looks like that comes from Schwab for the tax year 2022. You can see two fields there, total ordinary dividends, all right, and then qualified dividends. If those two numbers are exactly the same, then all your dividends are qualified. If they're different, so if qualified dividends is less, that means you have some dividends that are non-qualified. And again, you hand this over to your tax advisor and let them sort it out. Here's another example of a form that you might receive. This is one you received for one of our holdings, National Retail Properties. Again, you see the two fields there, total ordinary dividends and qualified. But look, qualified is blank. And actually, you have values under non-dividend distributions in Section 199A dividends. Those are non-qualified dividends. Why? Because National Retail Properties is a REIT. So basically this, on these 1099 forms, if 1A equals 1B, then you have nothing but qualified dividends. The difference would be income that is not what they say, non-qualified dividends. So let's go back to SCHD. Let's say I bought $400,000 in SCHD today, yielding 3.5%. I would receive $14,000 a year or eleven. 67 a month. Every year that amount increases by a certain amount, dividend growth, right? So the eight-year compound annual growth rate for SCHD is a remarkable 9.8%. Now, what you need to consider here is what other income might I have? So pre-retirement, a salary, and even if you reinvest those dividends when you receive them into back into SCHD, you're still going to pay capital gains. So note that. But these dividends in, in this example are just capital gains that your accountant will handle. What's more interesting is to look at what happens when I retire. So let's say I stop working my $750 a day job I learned about in the YouTube comment section and started living off my SCHD holding. Remember, I received $14,000 a year in capital gains. I have no other income. And you can see the table here. Just remember that it's growing, let's say, by 9.6% um, going forward. Let's assume that growth happens going forward. So it's likely to be more or less that number, you know, likely less one would think, right? It doesn't have a very long track record. After 14 years of growth at that 9.6% rate, I would hit that 40K capital gains threshold and I'd need to start paying taxes. You see, at that point, I'd be making 
$3,500 a month. That's not bad. I mean, having to pay, start paying some taxes on the, the excess of that isn't such a bad thing. And what's crazy about this is I haven't even touched that principal investment. That's nuts, right? So when you think about taxation for um, SCHD, you need to consider the income that you're getting along with the capital gains coming from those dividends. Now, my situation, most of my lifetime income contributed very little to Social Security. Now, I have three retirement accounts on three continents, each with different sets of rules on when I must start drawing. And as a Hong Kong citizen, I might be afforded certain perks. So my thoughts are, I want to minimize income to minimize taxation. But what really matters is what my accountant thinks. And that's why I employ an accounting firm with expertise in expat taxation. So if you need such a firm, uh, ping me, go contact us uh, via our website, and I'll send you a referral to them. They're excellent. Uh, when we look at then retirement accounts, because they're coming into the picture here, you have 401ks, IRAs, Roths. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, when you start withdrawing from your 401k or traditional IRA, those withdrawals are taxed as ordinary income. So then it starts to boost the capital gains, which goes on top of that, and you start moving closer to being taxed, right? Now you say, well, I won't withdraw. Well, there's required minimum distributions that IRA and retirement plan account owners generally need to start withdrawing, let's say, when they reach the age of 70 or 72. I think the latest rule is uh, 73 after December 31st, 2022. So if you retire at 63 and you've got nine years before you have to start drawing. Now, earnings that you withdraw from a Roth IRA don't count as income as long as you meet the rules for qualified distribution. So you see that there's a whole another a complex side of income generated from retirement accounts that will start to push up your total income, which then you add the capital gains from dividends on top of that, right? And it starts to exceed that bracket and you start to pay taxes. Again, having an accountant figure all this stuff out for you, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Also, you need to consider Social Security. So here are the rules straight from the IRS in terms of whether or not your benefits from Social Security are taxable. And you can see here that they take one half of those benefits, add it to all the other income that you have, and then the... Um, if that amount's greater than these base amounts they list here, then you start paying taxes. So you can see how, how complex this is. It goes back to that original advice that we gave you is that you need to hire an accountant. So the key takeaway here is that if you're holding SCHD, you don't have to worry about those dividends. They're going to be qualified unless, of course, you've been uh, holding, holding it for a shorter period of time. So what's so great about SCHD? Well, we answered that in this recent video that you ought to watch next. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel. Consider purchasing a report to support our work. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.